I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the Restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith, and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story, hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Good evening and welcome to the Ex-Mormon Files here in the heart of Salt Lake City. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you watching tonight. And we're continuing our discussion with Bill McKeever. Appreciate you staying with us. And Thank you. Uh, we've been covering some interesting topics. I. I hope you found that to be the case, and we have some more. We're going to talk a little bit about current events and some some of the things that have been happening maybe in the last ten or so years with uh, with the church and the the Mormon Christian debate. Um, I guess you've observed all of these little changes. What how, what have you thought when Huge. TV uh, TV twenties come I, along with uh, Sean McCraney and it's Doris Hansen and to get the information out in, in such a venue, of course, is is always important because you never know how many Mormons are out there just kind of channel surfing or going through various stations on the radio. Yeah. We, we get a lot of Mormons that listen to to our show. Mm -hmm. We know by the email that we right. hear from them and yeah. they're telling us that they're hearing it. And usually some of the complaints that they might have is something that we discussed recently on the show. Yeah. So they're listening yeah. and, and that's good. Yeah. Uh, I want them to listen. Yeah, so it, it helps kind of spread the word a little bit. and. I mentioned last week too, and we've talked about MRM.org, Bill McKeever's uh, website, and M M Mormonism Research Ministry, sorry about that. Uh, but uh, if you go to that website, you'll find some interesting things besides the interviews that they've done. Uh, they've gone through a number of books in depth, but they also have an interesting article. It's, it's called The Ten Lies That I Told as a Mormon Missionary. And then Bill also wrote the eight Mormon myths, and real quickly, that, that the church is the fastest growing, that there's no paid ministry, that the Book of Mormon contains Mormon doctrine, that all of Joseph Smith's prophecies came true, that Brigham Young never taught Adam was God. Book of Mormon is proven by archeology, span that polygamy was necessary because there were more women than men, and that Joseph Smith died as a lamb to the slaughter. I've heard Mormons use all those. I know. At some point. I, I believed so. every one of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So very faithfully. Well, one of the things I think we've noticed here in the last few months even is that the church has tried to be more transparent, they're saying, by coming out with different topics and different essays. You can go to LDS.org and look up these. And you've actually done a little intense or intensive research on these. Share, share a little bit about these essays. We uh, have. Essays. We've uh, done a series of radio shows and just about all of them, not yeah. all of them, but yeah. hopefully we will, you know, shortly. But the essays, I think, were meant by the church to show, as you said, that they are wanting to be more transparent yeah. with the information. Uh, unfortunately, we find that with some of them, they are trying to dispel myths by creating new myths. <laughs> uh, the most notorious of the essays where I think this is really happening big time is the Race and the Priesthood essay oh. that came out, I think, in December of 2013, uh, where they tried to pin the blame on the uh, ban on those of African heritage from holding the priesthood. They were trying to pin the blame on Brigham Young. Yeah, It was amazing how they threw Brigham Young under the bus on this one and were trying so hard to protect the integrity of Joseph Smith 
by making it sound like he really had virtually nothing to do with it. Yeah. Now what's interesting though is when you look at statements made by Mormon leaders prior to 1978 when the ban was lifted right. by the LDS Church right. and that thus allowing all worthy males to hold the priesthood regardless of their race, you don't find the leaders pointing to Brigham Young. No, Joseph Fielding Smith in particular, who was the 10th president of the church, was the church historian for about 50 years. He specifically said it didn't start with Brigham Young, that it went back to Joseph Smith. Now I will say that the evidence to support that is rather lean. I've not found a whole lot of primary sources from Joseph Smith saying some things very similar to what Brigham Young would later say. Uh, some of them are second-hand sources, but they were believed by the church members at that time. Yeah. Um, Joseph Fielding Smith believed it because he was using some of these second-hand sources to point to Joseph Smith as being the one who was behind this. Well, don't you find, too, that a lot of this is a, kind of comes from a doctrinal understanding of the way they were preaching or teaching it then, that the, the blacks and others of color, I guess, were fence sitters in heaven. I mean, that was part of their, the doctrine. Yeah, the phrase that was it. used was that they were less valiant. Less valiant. And that's a, a phrase that Bruce McConkie. Wishy-washy uh, yeah. in heaven and couldn't yeah. make a decision or something. We have plenty of statements from Mormon leaders prior to 1978 yeah. that would definitely support what you just said. Right. That there, the reason why those of African heritage could not hold the priesthood was because in the pre-existence during the war in heaven there was one-third of God's spirit children who were less valiant in the cause of Christ in choosing I guess Jesus to be the savior right. of the world as they right. understand it and because they were not as valiant as they could have been they were going to be allowed to get a body but they would not be allowed to have the priesthood, which of course is necessary for exaltation. That's true. And so that everybody would know who they are, they would be given this mark, and Brigham Young said the mark, this is Brigham Young, not me, he said the mark was the black skin and flat nose. Yeah. That's what he said. Yeah. That would be the way, I would assume, leaders in the Mormon church would know who was qualified and who was not qualified. Yeah. And that's the way it was up until 1978. And of course, my question after you know, 1978 was, well, if the mark for the priesthood ban was the black skin, and now that's no longer necessary, why are they still being born with the mark? I asked a missionary that one time, <laughs> and his answer to me was, well, it's genetics. I said, Dude, it's always been genetics. Yeah, always. I mean, come on, it's always been genetics. And I, I think that's a fair question, if that's yeah. the reason for the, the skin color, yeah. was to identify them, and we don't need that identification any longer, why are they still being born that way? Um, the whole banishment of blacks is certainly, you know, founded in, in the racism of its time. Sure. The new manual, or I should say the new essay that talks about this, hints of that, that Brigham Young was a product of his time. And I would say, okay, there were a lot of people, unfortunately, that were a product of their time, including many professing Christians. But should a prophet of God be a product of his time, or should a prophet of God be a product of the one he's supposed to be prophesying about? Yeah. Why was Brigham Young so duped? And not only that, and this is something that I think that the essay doesn't really delve into, at least not deeply enough for me, Okay, you want to blame Brigham Young for this? Fine. But what about all the prophets that came Since. after him that were teaching the same exact thing yeah. and also giving the impression that this is the way God wanted it? Yeah. How do you relieve them of the blame? I mean, you look at some of the statements, even by Joseph Fielding Smith, who is the man that they are studying right now in their gospel doctrine manuals. Yeah. They're looking at teachings of the presence of jo uh, teachings of presidents of the church, Joseph Fielding Smith right now. He said some of the worst statements you could ever imagine. Now, yeah. none of them are in this new manual, but they're not difficult to find. Yeah. They're certainly out there. <laughs> um, so I don't know how that helps to just pin the blame on, on Brigham right. Young. 
you would think that this would be a great opportunity for the leaders in the Mormon church to just fess up and admit we got it wrong. Yeah. Okay. These men did not hear from God. Product of the time. But the problem is, is if they're going to be honest in that direction, they're also going to have to be honest and say, okay, if you're going to admit you were wrong, were you also leading the membership astray with this doctrine? Yeah. They have to, they would have to say yes. But they get around that by saying, well, it was never a doctrine, yeah. which is flat out nonsense. Yeah. Flat out nonsense. For those of us that were that grew up in it, we know. Oh that was yes, a it was a doctrine, and it was even called a doctrine in a statement from the first presidency to the president of BYU. There, back in the 1950s, it says it is a doctrine. It's clear. Now you, uh, I know you know about uh, President Uchtdorf's comment about s admitting finally maybe that some of the leaders can make mistakes or. Did you but what <laughs> leaders? What, what leaders was he referring to? I, when I heard that, uh, I know a lot of people got excited about that, and I'm, I'm me being the skeptical yeah. person I am after doing this for so long. I'm thinking, who's he really what talking he about? Talking is he about? talking about the first presidency? Yeah, no. Or is he talking about the Council of the Twelve? Because he didn't mention who, who, who the leaders he's referring to. Right. Uh, could be the bishops. Or could it be president? the bishop? <laughs> now we know for a fact that it's not uncommon for the church to throw a, a lower level leader under the yeah, bus. Yeah. Look at poor Isaac Haight from Parowan uh, yeah. in the Mountain Meadows massacre. It was yeah. all Isaac Haight. I have a real Lee hard time believing that good, good religious Latter Day Saint men would wipe out men, women, and children over the order of a stake president. I just have a hard time to yeah. believe that. <laughs> These men needed to know they were going to be protected, and the only man who could give them that protection was Brigham Young. Yeah. So, But they don't want to put Brigham Young in that mix. But on this issue, they throw him right into the middle of yeah. it. But there, there's all sorts of questions that, that I have asked, and I have asked of Latter-day Saints, and I find many of them just don't think it through or they don't want to think about it. So yeah. do you think these essays are helping, like the Book of Abraham? Uh, no. no. I, I, I always think there's going to be some people in the Mormon church who you don't really have to do a lot of real deep convincing for them. Just, just say there's an believe. answer and they'll say fine. Well, the brethren have talked or spoken and written and so that, that takes I, care I hear of that it. a lot. Yeah. Well, you know, our apologists have answered that question and my response is, yeah, but they answered it badly. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> think, what if they answer? Think about it? this a little yeah. bit, yeah. The reason I, I think the gospel topic essays are going to cause them more problems than they already have is because they're not admitting to a lot of things that Mormons have kind of grown up traditionally believing, yeah. such as what we talked about with the race and the priesthood. Right. Um, I think a classic example, I have a copy of it, is uh, the article that was titled A Former Bishop's Doctrinal Dilemmas, talking about the uh, uh, Ganesh Charian from Wellington, New Zealand. When he hears this essay, and it's saying just the opposite of what he was told to teach and what he always believed. And then he starts feeling guilty. Was I misleading people by telling them these things? And what else am I might, what I might be misleading them about? That's also in your uh, MRM.org, I believe, is there yes, some yes. information on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I can imagine that he is not the only one to ask himself those questions. Yeah. There's probably a lot of Latter-day Saints that are reading these essays and knowing that that is not what they were told yeah. uh, and when they were growing up in the Mormon church who are going to have some real difficulties with this because if this is the only true church on earth <laughs> you think it ought to be telling some truth, right? Yeah, and that's so. what I thought was so strange about the book of Abraham when it talks about the translation and now it's an inspired revelation or something. Yeah, a, 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 re, a, trans, a revelatory translation or something like that. Yeah, you know. where we know that Joseph Smith said it, he was translating uh, over, over a period of time. And it, it, It's amazing to me, having never been a Mormon, at the great lengths many Latter-day Saints go to to protect the myth, to protect Joseph Smith. It, it just amazes me that it doesn't seem like Joseph Smith can do anything that bothers them or ruffles their feathers. 
and I've heard, I don't know how many times when I bring up the fact that Joseph Smith, for instance, had at least 33 wives that we know of, at least a third of them were teenagers, uh, two of them were 14 years old, uh, at least 10 of them had living husbands. Living husbands, isn't that amazing? I just heard that recently from a lady who was attending the church. She wasn't even a member yet. And and she, and she was making a very Mormon excuse for that. Well, you know, the marrying age back then was much yeah. lower. I said, well, 14, let me tell you, 14, less than 1% were married at the age of 14. To marry two 14-year-olds was unheard of. Yeah. To marry 10 married women was illegal. Yes, no. But yet Mormons will say, well, he was the prophet. Give him a pass for some reason. They always give him a pass, yeah. which it just floors well, me. We know because, he drank alcohol. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, but they will say, well, he was a prophet. My response to that now is, well, look, as a Christian, I have my own sets of prophets. I mean, I look at Isaiah and Jeremiah and Elijah yeah. as being prophets. Right. But what I don't see in the Bible is where just because they're a prophet, they're allowed to do whatever they want without yeah. consequence. Yeah. They still had to follow the parameters of biblical writ. But Joseph Smith, it seems like he can do whatever he wants, and because he's the prophet, he can, nobody can question that. It, it just floors me as someone who has never been a Latter-day Saint and how easily many Latter-day Saints give him that proverbial pass. Yeah. Well, I know Mark Twain, I think it is him, that said that it's easier to fool people than to tell them that they've been fooled. Well, there's probably a lot of truth and, to that. And they just, I don't, I don't know what the blindness necessarily is, where it comes from, but uh, God well, warned I, I, against I it. I think it's a spiritual blindness. Yeah. Uh, certainly, I would have to attribute it to that. Yeah. But still, when we are trying to shed some light on this issue with our yeah. LDS friends, it would be... I think a little more helpful if our LDS friends could see this as an act of compassion on our, our part towards sure. them rather than us just trying to be mean because that's certainly not what I'm trying to accomplish. Yeah. I don't want to be mean, but sometimes you have you to know, admit um, the truth does hurt. Yeah, make them think a little bit. Yes. Any thoughts on, I guess, a whole number of topics, but Swedish Rescue, did you, I know you did a detailed the, the Swedish rescue was, was fascinating to me only because a lot of the questions that were being asked at that Q&A in Stockholm back in 2010 were the same issues that we hear Mormons raising constantly here yeah. in the United States. Yeah. They were not all that different. And to see them asking those questions and having these two Mormon historians, Richard Turley and uh, Marlon Jensen were the two historians that were there to answer questions. Head over these. to Sweden to answer these questions. Yeah, right? apparently they were coming back from another oh. trip and stopped over in Stockholm to do this, and they were going to give them like two hours, which I thought was really unfair of the members there. If, if the church knew that they had these kind of questions, and they were so pressing that you're actually going to to reroute, if you will, <laughs> you know, two of your top historians to go and answer these questions. Give them more than two hours. But I listened to the tapes, I read the transcripts, and uh, I would not have wanted to be Richard Turley and Marlon Jensen. Kind of on the hot seat. Oh they? yes, yeah. and their answers were horrible. <laughs> they they were just horrible. You could tell they were probably not very comfortable being in that situation. Well, like you said, it's hard to defend. And, and I, as I kept looking at different things, it, it just crumbled as I began, continued looking. And, and they just don't have answers. They don't. They don't have and, good ones but anyway. there were some good things that came out of that because you've got Turley and, and Jensen admitting to some things very concisely. Uh, especially when it came to the polyandry, Joseph Smith marrying yeah. married women yeah. and his polygamy. Uh, both of them answered that question by very concisely saying, did Joseph Smith practice polygamy? Yes. Did he practice polyandry? Yes. That little quotation is a gem yeah. because I have talked to numerous Latter-day Saints 
that if they struggle believing Joseph Smith practiced polygamy, and many of them do, they have no problem with Brigham Young. No. But no, no, there was just Emma. Yeah. You know, but when I get them to say to see that that's not true, there was Emma, and now I throw in at least ten wives who had living husbands, that throws them over the edge like, that's oh, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. Why would you say such a horrible thing about her? Yeah, they don't believe you. Yeah. And here's <laughs> two Mormon historians. If anybody should know anything, it would be them. Yeah. Admitting that Joseph Smith practiced both polyandry and polygamy. I didn't know that as a Latter-day Saint. I didn't know that until after we came out. Yeah. It's amazing. You know, it's amazing how much you learn about your faith when yeah. you can finally look at it more objectively. Yeah. Most of us know more now than we ever did before. I hear that yeah. a lot from yeah. ex-Mormons. I was going to ask you about uh, lowering the missionary age. Any thoughts on that? Is that going to come back to hurt the church? Or I think is that it a good might. Idea? I think it might. Uh, I mean, these young men are so naive anyway at 19 and but, have no... But, Earl, at 18, we knew everything. Well, that's right? maybe, maybe that's the difference. Uh, <laughs> you realize you don't know everything at 19? I don't know. I think there's going to be a lot of 18-year-olds that go from being the top dog on the campus to the real world, and now you're up against people who have actually done some studying on this, and yeah. they're going to find out very quickly that they're not going to get a free pass from most of the people no, who have studied No, if you're standing Mormons. there with your badge, you're yeah. expected to know something, and that you're representing... I think it's going to probably crush a lot of Latter-day Saints, and we know that the statistics um, of those who come back from their mission are not all that encouraging. No. Many of them go inactive. Yeah. They don't go apostate. Right. They just kind of go off inactive and never go back again. And of course, those, n those names would still be on the church records, sure. and the Mormon church will point to those numbers as look looking pretty robust. Yeah. But how many of them are really practicing the faith and even still believe the faith, yeah. but just have not gone through the embarrassing, tense situation <laughs> of getting their name taken off the, the record? Yeah. Well, have you been encouraged over the last many years as we've talked about when books like Grant Palmer's book, Insider's View of Mormon Origins, and Todd Compton's I, I, In Sacred Loneliness, and some of that? Is that encouraging? It's been encouraging. In fact, it's funny you ask that because just today I, I'm planning on going back to California for a missions gathering at our home church in California and they wanted to do, interview a lot of the missionaries and we only have 60 seconds to answer this question. Oh. Get, getting me to answer anything in 60 seconds is tough enough but they had a list of questions to, as samples and the one question they had on there, what's encouraged you the most? And I said that's the question I want because <laughs> I have been very encouraged with what, by what I am seeing. Yeah. And a lot of Mormons that are starting to ask serious questions about their faith and are coming out. That's My email shows this. Yeah. And it's been very incredible. My, my prayer though, and many times when I speak at churches outside of Utah, and I tell them, be encouraged by what we're seeing in Utah. Good things are happening. Here's the big problem that we are facing now to a certain extent, but we'll be facing more to a greater extent. There's not enough Christians in Utah that are familiar enough with this subject or close enough to their Mormon neighbors that when the neighbor starts to have these questions to guide them towards Christianity. I was going to ask you about this, so if thanks they're not for there, sharing this. If they're not there, the chances are usually very good that that ex-Mormon is going to slip off into agnosticism or atheism. Yeah. We don't want to see that. They've been burned once, they know they've been burned, and they think, well, I can't trust the Bible, I can't trust the cross. So I'll trust the devil. So I won't trust <laughs> you know, anything. And that yeah. there's no God whatsoever. Yeah, I know? mean, it's scary, isn't yeah. it? It is. It's frightening, and I've seen it happen many times. Yeah. There seems well, they to become be... Bitter and, uh, they're yeah, not, they're not making you can that understand transition. Why. Yeah, you know the the church has given them all these promises, and then they find out these promises are nothing. Yeah, and because they've been led to believe that the Bible is not to be trusted, yeah. and that, that's why I've got to chuckle when I see guys like Jeffrey Holland get up in general conference and act how much they love the Bible. Yeah, I feel like Mr. Holland, would you like to read my emails yeah. from Latter Day Saints? I don't see that love. They carry uh, it to the church, but sure they, they, don't, do. they don't read it. But what, why is it, though, when you start bringing up some problems with the Book of Mormon, one of the first defenses for many Latter-day Saints is, well, what about the Bible? Yeah. You can't trust it. No, that's I hear right. that all the time. Yeah. 
And of course, I'm prepared for that. Yeah. So, well, tell me what what's bothering you. Let's talk about it. Hey, before we finish, and we've only got a couple of minutes, you you uh, have been down to Manti, as you mentioned several times. Carry a little or pull a little red wagon with some gold <laughs> plates in it, and yeah. or some facsimiles and. Right. Uh, I know we don't even have enough time to share even a story probably with that, but has that been fun to do and have members try to heft those heavy things? It has been fun. Yeah. Uh, I use it mainly as a little illustration as just to show yeah, why people. I have a problem with this story. Yeah. And I will tell Mormons, I say, look, missionaries come to my home, they want me to believe the story of the Book of Mormon. I cannot get past this part of the story. Before you're going to want me to believe in the spiritual message of the Book of Mormon, help me with this story. The practical here. <laughs> exactly. And when I get them to see how the story really is not something that can be tested scientifically, either by repeating it, observing yeah. and repeating, because that's yeah. what science is, um, that causes a lot of problem for a lot of Latter-day Saints. Yeah. And well, I don't know. Again, make them think. Yeah, and I don't know if it's me, but I've been noticing there sure have been a lot of articles in Mormon publications in recent years about the weight of the plates. Yeah, there. But none of them really address my rebuttals. Oh, interesting. You know, I wish they would. One of the things you end or begin your show with at Viewpoint on Mormonism is that you uh, speak with gentleness and respect. And we've only got a minute left. Could you, could you maybe? Why do you use those phrases? And I use the phrase because it comes out of First Peter three. Yeah. And I, that is a, uh, an admonition to Christians that when we share our faith, we should have answers as to why we believe what we believe, but we need to do it in a certain way. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I, I, I think it's important that Mormons realize that we have a genuine concern for them. I don't think being obnoxious or arrogant with them is going to get anywhere with them. No. I, I think we really need to see them for the people that they are who have questions just like everybody has questions. Have good hearts and they want to, they're probably wanting to serve a God, their God, but they just don't I, I understand. I think many of them are very sincere. Yeah. And, uh, but I think that admonition is something that we try to live up to. Now, if you were to ask me, do I do that 100%? I'm <laughs> going to be honest. I've had my, I say, I've had my palm to the forehead moments yeah. where, like, why did I say that? But still, I think that is uh, a way that we should practice. Well, Bill, you've done such a wonderful work here and, and dedicated your life to Mormonism, uh, essentially. And uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate the respect I have for you and, and the things you've shared. And I know you continue to share your message. And we appreciate you so much. And thanks for coming on with us Thank last you. three weeks. Good night.